Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thanks very much for your patience while we set stuff up. Um, welcome to the next installment of the Future of Games speaker series. Um, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Peter Hastings. Peter is an associate professor in the computer science department at DePaul University and has a background in uh, natural language processing and intelligent tutoring systems. And um, he's going to talk today about uh, research directions for educational and slash serious games. So, well, I noticed that we've got the video here. Do, did we want to have the video or the slides? I don't know. The, the video, because if, you know, if I'm standing here, you can see me in slides. That's better, okay. Um, right, so my background is in natural language processing and intelligent tutoring. It's not in games, so I want to say right off the bat that I'm not a games expert. I've just started learning about games. I'm in the last couple months. I'm not a gamer, uh, so but you know that's not going to stop me from talking about it a little bit today. Um, and uh, there's been a little bit of debate. How many of you were at the Johnson talk last night? Just wondering, he was. He brought up this idea of a crisis in education and uh, was sort of skeptical about it. He says we're all smarter than we used to be or the people some years ago were because we play games and do so much multiprocessing in our life. Um, do, how many of you think that education is worse now than it was, say, uh, 25 years ago? Okay, a few people, all right. Um, some certainly think so, and there's plenty of uh, alarmist uh, reports about how bad uh, students are doing in education. And I'm not going to take a stand on that because essentially the kind of work I like to do is to develop technology for education. And so it sort of helps uh, if people think we really need something else uh, to improve education. And uh, as I said in my abstract, the, the current one of the current things that seems to be a hot topic for education is uh, games to help people learn. So um, I want to start out the talk by talking about learning. And um, you know, the first thing I want to think about is, and you know, we're all in education in some form or another, and uh, spend a lot of time in education. But it seems to me that people generally kind of don't really think about how learning happens at really the low level. So I was going to ask you, you know, what, what does learning mean to you? What happens during learning? I was afraid, though, that somebody might give a really good answer to it, and then I would just have to say, oh, OK, that's more than I knew. Uh, but I just want to sort of ask you semi-rhetorically to think about what do you think happens in our heads when we learn something? So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And part of the thing uh, of my thinking here goes along with, uh, my son is six years old, and he's obviously very smart. Uh, and he's learning to read now. And, and so, you know, he's getting, he's sort of getting there, and he can uh, read some words and write some words. But, you know, if he sees this on a, a piece of paper, how many of you can identify what that is? Uh, <laughs> he can do it. You know, like 60% of the time he'll say that's a B, and 40 or 35% he'll say it's a D, and some percent he'll say it's a P. Uh, and I think that we tend to forget all of the steps that are involved in, in not just learning, but being able to understand, to comprehend something. So if we want to read, we obviously have to be able to distinguish Bs from uh, Ds and Ps and other letters. But that's part of the processing that we have to do in our brains. And I know as an instructor, I tend to always fall into the kind of trap of, you know, I work hard to th think about exactly what I'm going to say that's going to be the perfect bit of information that I need to give to my students that then they'll understand exactly what I want them to understand. And I get upset sometimes when they don't get it, even though I've delivered the per perfect bit of information to them. And I think I forget that there's really it's a, a big process going from comprehending, perceiving some sort of uh, language, and then breaking that down into its parts, understanding what the intention is 
of what I was trying to say and then connecting that to what the hearer or the learner thinks about that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about low-level um, aspects of learning at first, and then I'm going to get into um, some framework uh, for evaluating learning and for uh, intelligent tutoring systems. And then I'll talk a little bit about games towards the end of the talk. So um, I like to say human learning can be very efficient, but that's not always a, a really good thing because people are good at learning. Our brains really learn well, but sometimes they don't learn exactly what we want, what we would like them to learn. So I'm thinking in, in terms of shortcuts or um, like if you're if you're playing a certain game, we've been talking a lot about games recently, and you know you learn how to sort of, oh, I can figure out how to solve this level by going on the web to find somebody else who's already done it, and then I can uh, uh, get the the answers to how to go and and get past this level. So you're sort of circumventing the maybe the game designer's uh, ideas of how that should be solved. Um, and the other main point here is that. We want to talk about learning and not just learning facts, like rote memorization of facts, which aren't connected, but learning with understanding. And learning with understanding means that we know the concepts and we can use them, we can apply them, uh, we can generate new ideas because um, what we've learned new is connected to what we knew before. So um, learning is not, as I said, surface memorization. It's not, um, we're not talking, well, Obviously, skill learning is learning, but it's not the kind of learning that I'm going to talk about today. Um, but learning is, we have to learn concepts. We have to learn connections between concepts. We need to know how to use uh, the concepts for analyzing something new that we've seen and uh, synthesizing, creating, generating um, new ideas based on those concepts. And also, uh, transfer is going to be a key uh, a key issue here, and that we're going to get into that a little bit more later. But you know, we learn how to do. We we learn something in a particular setting, but we're not going to be using that in exactly that setting. The purpose, the reason why we're learning, is not just so that we can, um, you know, pass this test and get out of this class and then move on in our education, but so hopefully that we can apply that um, knowledge in some other ways in our life. So. Um, now I'm going to kind of get into the science of learning. I'm just going to sort of whip through a little bit of a hardware view of learning and um, then really sort of focus here on derived principles, a little bit on novice expert differences. Um, and so I'll get into that. So uh, at the hardware level of learning, learning happens in uh, the brain. This brain comes with numbers on it. I don't think ours normally do have that. but. Um, Here's, I just had to include this because this is a slice of the brain with bits of body attached. Although I, I noticed not the naughty bits. Um, and the, this is showing how, uh, how many neurons in this particular slice of our brain are devoted to dealing with uh, sensory input from these different parts of our body. It's just one of my favorite pictures. Um, at the low level, we got neurons which have connections between uh, we got neurons that are the sort of basic hardware, and then the connections between neurons are where we get the, the complexity of how we think. And when we learn, it basically alters the real physical structure of the connections between the neurons, and that in turn alters the functional organization of the brain. And uh, let's see if this works. I found some nice pictures of neurons. No, it can't because it's not connected somehow. But huh. I thought it would be. Uh, that would be good if you can. There's a couple other things I want to show. So what can I say about neurons? And I don't want to like uh, overstress something that you already know. So do how many of you like know about neuroanatomy or neurons and things like that? How they how they work? Sort of a remarkable hardware that we've got. It's a lot, it reminds me a lot of um, thinking about it in this way in terms of like a, the old time operator who used to uh, sit at the desk and uh, you know, she gets a, 
incoming call from somebody and they want to be connected to somebody else. So she takes the wire from one, uh, one connection and plugs it into a spot and then plugs in the outgoing wire into a related spot. And so this sort of rewiring kind of thing is going on in our brains as we learn um, without that uh, special operator person who's doing it. It's kind of a, this automatic process which works out really well for us. And uh, so, you know, here's lots of different kinds of neurons here. And uh, here's sort of a generic neuron with our, the nucleus and it's got, you can think of it as an input and output device. It gets input from uh, dendrites. I guess I should, since we've got split attention kind of thing going on. It gets inputs from the dendrite uh, across synapses and then collects the inputs in the nucleus and when the inputs get to a certain level, uh, sends out an electrical pulse along the axon and that in turn turns into a chemical um, message, a chemical pulse that goes across the uh, axon, from the axon terminal across a synapse to another, the dendrite of another neuron. And there's a really cool uh, animation here. I'll just show a little bit of it down below here. This is just, I don't know, it looks like ants running around in a little ant colony. But shows a bit about how the information travels around between neurons and groups of neurons. And as it says a little bit lower, um, this kind of showing one or two connections from one neuron to another. But in, uh, in general, there, there's thousands of connections that are coming into a particular neuron. So it's a very complex machinery. And uh, I don't know, the fact that it actually works is really surprising <laughs> in a way. So uh, showing the synapses and such. Uh, but I won't spend too long there. Uh, let me get back to the other stuff. Okay, good. And uh, so to, now to move in from the kind of low-level hardware view to some principles that have been learned. And most of these are taken from a, a book called How People Learn which was uh, assembled by a group of experts. Um, and, and they're all sort of empirically derived principles of how people learn. So one thing is that uh, new information needs to connect to prior knowledge. So it, what doesn't work is to give somebody some concept that is in no way connected to anything that they already know. Um, if, if there's not that connection, then that won't be retained and it won't make any sense. Um, there's a, a common way of thinking, this relates to how I started out, was talking about teaching as information delivery, um, where I'm coming up with this perfect package of information that I'm going to give to the student, and the student's going to receive that information, essentially plug it into um, their brain, and then they have it, uh, and then they can go on from there. But that's not the way things work. Uh, there is no upload button that I can push to upload my information into the student's brain. Uh, constructivism is it, it's really sort of turning it around in, in terms of learning for the student. Uh, it, to learn something, the student has to take some representation of information, actively process that, constructing it, building it onto what they already know. So there's a, a lot of responsibility on the part of the learner. And uh, active learning, uh, this sort of mirrors that Basically, the learner has to be actively involved um, at basic understanding, uh, thinking about doing inferences to connect new information to old information, and also at the metacognitive level of thinking about, okay, so uh, this is how I process that information. Um, is, does my way of processing this particular information apply to something else uh, as well? And that really, um, leads into the requirement for reflection. And I think this is a lot of, uh, this is one of the things that I as a teacher often forget about. Uh, in basically, you know, I give the students some information and I think that it just sort of gets there and it's stuck immediately, real time. But really students need to reflect on new information um, to be able to do that connection with what they already know. Um, assessment, um, a couple slides ago I said, well, uh, we need to connect information to what we already know. Well, for a teacher, you basically, the, the idea here is that you have to present information that is related to what they already know, 
at the right level of relation. And if you can't do that if you don't know what the student knows. So I, I used to think of assessment as you know, something I have to do in order to give students a grade. But in fact, it's really important for the process of teaching. I guess you might call it a formative assessment. Um, it's not just the summative where you're giving the final grade, but you're having, having to evaluate where is that student now so that I know what they can handle um, for the next lesson. Oops, I went a little too far. And uh, closely related to that is the idea of the zone of proximal development from Vygotsky. We were talking about Vygotsky at lunch. Um, <laughs> and th that's the idea there is that you, know, you could sort of make a graph of, uh, you know, if this is the level of knowledge going up, just if we could somehow enumerate knowledge and this is where a student is along this. They're, they're right here, right now. And hopefully over time, that knowledge will be increasing. The idea of the zone of proximal development is that at each stage, there's, this is the level of the student's knowledge. There's this sort of envelope here where this is the, the ripe area for presenting new information that can be close to what the student already knows, not it's not something that the student already knows, but it's close enough that the student's going to be able to connect that in somehow. So that's the zone of proximal development. Sorry if you can't see that from over there. Um, facts are important. Uh, I, I tend to think of, OK, well, th this is just giving facts. But basically, we need facts as a sort of foundation of uh, learning how to process things. Um, so they're not the only thing that are important, but facts, teaching facts in a new area is important. Uh, and a little bit about uh, a final, I think, part of this is uh, the differences between experts and knowledge, uh, novices, sorry. Um, there's qualitative differences. If you look at experts in any particular area, compare them to novices in that area, it's not just a quantitative difference. It's not just that Experts do the same thing that novices do it, but they do it this much faster or this much more thoroughly or whatever. There's really qualitative differences. And another key aspect of this is that it's not just differences in what they do, but there's also big differences in how they perceive a situation. So if you show a, an expert chess player a chessboard, um, and you know they've done experiments where they just flash for milliseconds a chessboard and show it to an expert chess player versus a novice chess player, the expert chess player will remember that very well. They'll be able to recreate exactly the, the board position as long as it's a board position that would normally occur during the process of a game. If it's a board position that was just sort of randomly scattered pieces around the board, experts are no better at recalling that than novices are. So really, the difference there is in the perception of the situation. And that's you know getting back to the B versus D. The perception of a situation is really an important thing in the process of learning. So there's qualitative differences in the perception. In retrieving knowledge, how do we understand, how do we bring out from our memory things that are related to processing this new information? And how do we choose what to do with this new information? And Sort of, in, in some ways, uh, a negative side effect of this is called expert blindsight, where you'll get experts in a slightly new situation who just won't be able to figure out how to operate in that situation as well as a novice would. Because what a novice is doing in this situation is they're doing uh, you know, sort of bottom-up processing, uh, problem solving, figuring out what can I possibly do to solve this, this problem. But the expert will just sort of see it and know what to do. But because they have that very automatic processing, they might not see how there are other ways of doing something or there are flaws in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that processing that they would have had to do if they were doing it from the bottom up. All right, uh, yeah, I mentioned transfer before. So, and again, the, the efficiency of learning. So um, people are good at learning things in general. but depending on what the situation is that they're learning in, 
they might not be learning what we really want them to learn. So if, I, you know, if I'm telling a class about algebra, and, and you think about this, I'm, I'm in a certain classroom talking about algebra, and I give some fact about algebra. How does the student know that what should be learned about algebra doesn't include anything else that they're perceiving? It doesn't include information about the room that they're in, who they're sitting next to, um, the random sound out in the hallway, uh, the smell of something that's uh, wafting in. How does the learner distinguish what's important information for this new knowledge and what's not? So that's an important thing we have to think about in learning. Uh, and there's various different types of transfer. I won't go into the details right now. Um, but the sort of summary of all of this is that learning is hard work for the learner especially. It's hard work for the teachers too, yes. But for the learner, the, in order for learning to be effective, the student, the learner, has to be doing a lot of work. And that leads us to the concept of motivation, that for learning to be effective, we really need the students to want to learn, to want to learn that particular information, and, and to learn it in a way that they'll be able to use it later. And this is, of course, related to the whole idea of games in education. Um, people see that kids like to play games, they're motivated to play games and to do well, and they think, well, if you know, we can get them doing this, if we could just sort of inject some information, some uh, real world serious knowledge there, and sneak that in there, then they'll be learning about the real world, and they'll want to do it, and they'll really learn a lot. Um, I thought about including some, uh, something about models of learning, but I think there's really not enough time to do that today. Uh, there's some models that are just sort of zipped through this. Some models, neural nets, are really closely related to the neurons. Um, production rules are, have been a very, uh, well, a productive way of thinking about learning. Um, but I'm not going to go into the details. If, if somebody has a particular question about this, I can get back to it. Uh, but this le led me to the... Uh, there's sort of a jump here between that was the, the principles of learning and, um, and basically for, for me, I wanted to, to figure out how, like I said, technology can be used in education. And so one of the first ways I was doing this was with the intelligent tutoring systems. And that's really been the focus of my research in my academic career so far. Um, and I'm just going to show you a few of the systems that I worked on. I'm not going to do any real long demos of them, but just to sort of give you a taste of them. Uh, this is uh, the story station system uh, we were talking about at lunch, where um, the idea is this is for second, third, fourth, fifth graders who are learning to write stories. And it's in a particular task called story retelling. So they see a storyteller give a story, or they look at a video, and they're supposed to make their own version of the same story. And they write it in this kind of word processor thing. And then they have these various animated characters who can give feedback about the story from different points of view. And the whole idea here is that, well, write, writing is hard. Who thinks that writing is hard? I sure do. OK, a few of you don't, but most of you do. Uh, why is writing hard? Can, can somebody explain it? Why is writing hard? I've heard lots of hypotheses. Anybody have an idea? What's the basics? You're right? Very good, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so your, your thoughts about it may be all mixed, but you have to, like, basically has to read from left to right or front or top to bottom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking about this at lunch, and we were saying that, uh, you know, the, the most common things that people talk about are, like, uh, in terms of giving feedback on writing or spelling and grammar and those, these sort of low-level things. But this is great that the kinds of things that you've mentioned here are very high level in terms of planning um, processes. 
And so my idea with this project was that part of the difficulty that students have in learning to write is that there are really all of these constraints, constraints that, that you talked about here, um, which are difficult to explain to kids. And so I thought, well, maybe we can just, by associating a different animated agent with different types of these constraints, then we don't have to kind of be able to explain, define what, you know, thinking about your reader's knowledge means. We can just have one agent that gives feedback from the point of view of a particular reader. Uh, so that was the concept be behind the story station system, uh, which unfortunately we didn't get quite to the uh, level of evaluating it to see how well does it actually work. But we did find out that girls like the agents better than boys do. Boys would much rather just sort of get feedback from the system, no agents. Um, this is another one that was a, a system that I um, sort of copied off. Uh, there was an early uh, tutor to develop Lisp uh, programming abilities, and it was sort of becoming obsolete, and so I created a new uh, version of it. Um, so you can, you know, it gives you an assignment to create a, an expression and then select um, parts of the Lisp code that would create that, or else type it in, then it gets put into the answer area. And you can get feedback um, from the system based on what parts of uh, what you've written so far and what's the difference between that and what it's expecting. So a very different kind of tutoring system. Uh, then the next one is uh, Research Methods Tutor. This is one that I've been uh, working on a lot. And this is kind of a, a clone of Auto Tutor, which is a system I worked at previously uh, at University of Memphis, uh, which is a dialogue-based intelligent tutoring system. And uh, part of the, the basic foundation of these systems is that they're mimicking behavior of human tutors and helping students construct information in their heads. Now, it turns out, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, is that one of the things that we found out about human tutors is that despite the fact that they're really good at helping human students, they're very effective, much better than classroom education where it's one instructor and 20, 30 or more students. This one-on-one -on -one interaction is very effective for learning for the students. However, if you ask a human tutor that's not like an expert tutor how much they understand about the state of knowledge of their student, it's very low. They're really not that good at evaluating how much their students know, which is a little bit of a shock, especially compared to what I was saying about the zone of proximal development and everything before. But still, um, these are, are, are shown Tutoring in general is shown to be uh, very effective. And um, my research methods tutor is, is browser-based, and there's a text version of it and a talking head version of it. Um, and it actually works, and it improves learning. And um, some of the auto a lot of the auto-tutor evaluations have been done in a lab setting where there's intensive use of the tutor. But um, my system, we've evaluated in conjunction with a class on research methods in psychology, where the students are using the tutor at various points throughout the term. And uh, we've shown that it actually works in the real world in, you know, despite the fact that the students might be like, they go out to the bar, then they use this thing on their computer afterwards. You know, who knows what they're actually doing with the system. Uh, not ideal, but they still are learning from using the system. So, which I think is almost surprising, but very good news. <laughs> oh, and this is just a picture of the, of the tutoring system in the, the agent version. And the idea of having an agent here is that human tutors tend to seldom give direct negative feedback. No, you're wrong. They say, well, I don't know. And they, so they use tone of voice and gestures to give subtle negative feedback that doesn't you know, slap the student in the face and say, you're stupid, which would be bad for the, their motivation to keep to continue. Um, but it keeps the, it sort of subtly gives that negative uh, information. But uh, the interface here, uh, Johnson was talking last night about interface. The interface of this is very pared down, which really the, the interface between a human tutor and a human student would also be very spare. So these uh, intelligent tutoring systems are, are nice, but a problem with developing these things is that they're really complex systems. 
There's so many parts to these systems, and if they're effective, you say, okay, this is great, and this really works well. If they're not effective, we say, well, we haven't done enough tests, <laughs> or maybe we need to develop a little bit more material or something like this. But it's almost impossible to causally link some aspect of that system with success in learning. So this has kind of pushed us towards we need some type of framework for scoring a system or evaluating a system that will tell us you know, these parts are important or, or for, for um, looking at creating a new system, what do we need to focus on? So uh, here's some uh, e-learning principles uh, from Clark and uh, Mayer. Uh, multimedia principle, we should use different uh, modalities of input. Contiguity principle, put things close together. These are all sort of based on low-level psychological uh, perception, um, processing sorts of concerns. Um, and they, have, they suggest things that work well and things that don't work, but they're fairly high level. Um, at the sort of other end of the spectrum, we had uh, these, we had a workshop. I don't know, James, were you in this one with, uh, this was in what, not Biarritz, but the uh, San Sebastian. Okay, this was a few years back, but it was a workshop on dialogue-based tutoring systems. Um, and the keynote of the uh, workshop was talking about different possible conjectures that we might sort of, if we wanted to prove theorems about dialogue-based tutoring systems, uh, what might these theorems look like? So I got a sort of, uh, it's basically saying there's a correlation between if x goes to y, that means if this is better, then this is better. So natural language understanding, does improve natural language understanding improve the responses of the student? Uh, does improve natural language generation improve responses of the student? Uh, does the number of responses um, lead, uh, is that correlated with cognitively engaged performance? Uh, is cognitively engaged performance linked to learning? Uh, and there's like, and then we had the sort of a brainstorming session where we came up with some more of these. And these are all questions that we don't know the answers to. In the area of our research, we don't know. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, I think on the next slide I have some, some of these things we've got um, information about. Ooh, this is kind of funny order, but all right. So there's some empirical support for some of these things, but really not a lot. Um, so that's some of the framework. That's the state of the art of the frameworks for tutoring systems. And that, you know, in the last few minutes here, um, leads me to thinking about games and talking about games anyway. And uh, so. I, I realized that last night that I do have some, uh, some, some street cred for the games area that I was a, a co-author on this one paper a couple years ago on addiction to internet and online gaming um, where my student Brian did a survey of uh, people who would, would spend you know, dozens of hours doing MMORPGs uh, and he compared that to uh, a diagnosis from the, the DSM, whatever the psychological manual is, that says this is an addictive behavior. He decided it wasn't actually addiction because um, part of the definition of addiction said that it would take you away from your normal, normal social interaction. And it turned out that for the people who were spending these hours and hours on these games, that was their social interaction. They were, they were likely to get very, if they weren't doing the games, they would be you know, sitting at home watching TV it's not taking them away from social interaction that they would normally get. And they were actually getting more social interaction playing the game uh, as long as you, you know, include the interaction there that they're in the, having in the game as social interaction, which I would. And this is, uh, I got to say, this is the, the one paper that I've, where as a result of this, I've gotten a call from a reporter who wanted to ask me about the paper. I was really sort, uh, sort of excited about that. It was a reporter from um, People Magazine which I thought was kind of interesting. I didn't quite know what to, uh, to say to a reporter from People Magazine, but you know, whatever. Um, and th so there's, how many of you know this? Now, uh, this is one thing I have to find out. How do you pronounce this guy's last name? G, okay, G? Because I've heard G, G, you know, back and forth. Uh, all right, so G. So he's got this book about what people learn from games, and he's got 36 principles 
of learning in games. And he's uh, coming from the area of linguistics and meaning making, uh, semiotics. So a lot of these are sort of related to creating meaning out of a certain situation. And uh, so there's that, certainly that um, taste here. Uh, these are things that he derived from his own experience in getting into playing games. Um, but I think we can notice that a lot of these are related to some of the stuff about the science of learning that I talked about before. So active critical learning is a big aspect of this. Um, let's see, discovery in order of uh, having the students make, dis make choices about what they're doing. There's active processing involved there. Um, and probing is a part of that. Uh, and ongoing learning. Uh, there's something here about like different levels of um, knowledge to keep the, keep the challenge going, kind of related to that zone of proximal development. So we can sort of see some parallels between some of these uh, and a lot of the science of learning things. But one thing that people have really complained about uh, with respect to this book is you know, that they're uh, very, these principles sound good, but G doesn't really provide a lot of empirical evidence for using them. Yeah, here's transfer over here. And uh, well, I, I was thinking, well, we could try take some time and try to uh, use those principles to evaluate a particular game. But well, f unfortunately, we're out of time. And so it's, like I said, I'm not really a gamer, so I wouldn't know how to do that myself. I would have to have you do that. Um, I just talked to a student at Carnegie Mellon a couple weeks ago. And she said, oh, I did a, a study with these G principles and looking at math games that are provided by uh, the textbook publisher for students in, uh, I, this is elementary school students, I think. So math games that come along on the, the CD-ROM that's included with the, with the um, textbook. And so she took, uh, she and her uh, partner on this project, they started with the 36 um, principles and um, got rid of a bunch of them. They ended up with only six principles um, because of a couple problems. One is that there was this sort of uh, assumption on, in the G book that these are things that are these high resolution video games, which these math games certainly were not. So a lot of them just didn't apply for that reason. Uh, but then the other one is about this, which I just, I like this word. And I was telling somebody about how you can't do this in English really very well, but or very often. But the operationalization ability of the principles. That is how, you know, you see this principle and it's stated that, and there, there's another like, uh, if you look back here, there's this, this is the title of the principle, and then there's a couple other sentences which describe it. But how can you measure uh, to what extent is, does a game use intuitive knowledge? Or what, to what extent, uh, well, maybe multiple routes is a little bit easier. But it, they had a lot of difficulty just figuring out which of these could actually be measured. And as it says, they uh, went through the games, and they found that none of these six appeared significantly in these games. And actually, evaluations of the games have shown that they really don't help the students learn either. So maybe that's, maybe that's a support for the principles. Um, yeah, so are we going to apply it to some game? I, yeah, I'm not sure. If you, if you we could talk in, during the discussion about you know, how well do these principles really apply to some of the games that you guys have seen. Um, but that leaves me, uh, you know, we were kind of complaining about the Johnson talk last night, how it sort of ended not with a bang, but a, a whimper. There, these are some, here's some points that he made, but not really firm conclusions. And that's sort of how I'm going to end too. But um, the issues that I see for dealing with the, uh, with the games are, and this is something that Johnson raised, is his claim that basically by playing chess or by playing uh, video games, people are generating, they're building up their mental muscle, creating these general cognitive processing and learning capabilities. Whereas the research sh sort of uh, shows that you know we learn something in a particular area, can it transfer to other areas? Not necessarily. Um, refining, we we've got. It's good to have these kinds of principles like G has, but they need to be refined so that they can actually be uh, measured and operationalized. Um, in, in the uh, in the study that I referred to in the abstract, there was the explicit claim that it had to be high-resolution graphics. Well, is, 
it, are high resolution graphics, can you get by with low resolution graphics? Can you get by with no graphics at all? Do you need music? What is the importance of music for a game? Some game developers I talked to said, oh, you gotta have music in a game. Um, but some of the Mayor and Clark uh, research says that music is a distraction and it actually hurts learning. So uh, that could be an issue. And then we get to the, the sort of turning it around. What doesn't matter for learning? What are aspects that you can, it doesn't matter if you have this in your system or not. It, it almost seems like potentially any aspect of your system could be crucial for how well do students learn from it. Uh, and the idea of gaming a game, had interesting conversations re recently with people who were, had been testing their tutoring systems in laboratory settings, and then they found that students did fairly well, but then they found in the, if they were doing them in some less controlled situation, they were just giving each other the answers, how to do it, or you know, one person would figure out the solution and then hand it out to the other uh, students, things like that. Um, so cheating or gaming the, the system is a potentially large issue. Um, linking the, the principles that we looked at don't talk at all about what are our learning objectives. They're, he, G was basically talking about learning within the game. But if you're talking about using a serious game, an educational game, you want that student to learn something in particular that's related to the real world. So how do you measure that um, connection between what's done in the game and what's going to apply in the real world? Um, is it possible just to inject the game into some other sort of educational technology system and then that boosts the motivation of the student such that they learn more from the other aspect of it even though it doesn't have those game capabilities? And then evaluation is the other big, big, big problem. Um, and this is part of it, is if your game is meant to uh, simulate what happens in the real world, how do you test it? Do you just, if you're training soldiers to do a certain kind of st strategy, do you just you know, send the soldiers out and see if they've learned that strategy by whether or not they get killed, uh, or how many people they kill, or, or something like that? It's, it's a tough question. Um, or you know, if you don't want to do that, which there's good reasons not to. Can you use a multiple choice test to measure what they've learned from the game? How accurate is a multiple choice test in determining uh, real, world, real world abilities? Uh, would anybody believe a test that's embedded in the learning game itself? So if you're, you've got the simulator, which is supposed to simulate what's going on in the real world, and you evaluate the student's learning in the context of that simulation, and you present this to somebody else, they're gonna say, oh come on, you just, you just sort of set them up to know how to do this, but that doesn't mean that they'll be able to transfer it out of there. And uh, like with what I said about AutoTutor before, uh, oh no, this is different, but is the best evaluation whether they've won the game or what their skill level is? Um, and as I said before about the, this is human tutors don't really assess uh, students very well. Um, so, how important really is that? Um, I've been working on a game uh, concept with some others uh, up in Illinois, and uh, this is for the purpose of building argumentation skills, but I'm really sort of running to the end of my time, so I'm not gonna uh, talk too much about that. Um, but uh, I would be very happy to get your ideas and uh, questions about any of all of this. So if you wouldn't mind if you ask a question, let me come over and give you this microphone. Are there any questions? Testing. Okay. So uh, you have a lot of questions about evaluation for games and intelligent Might need to hold it a little closer. So you have a lot of questions about evaluation for games and other intelligent tutoring systems and things like that. How do you plan on evaluating your game? Well, with our with this particular game that we're working on, it's been it's sort of we're making in the grant we've been developing essentially intelligent tutoring systems, which are evaluated in particular ways. Uh, you know, with a, a horde of grad students rating the you know the participants' answers and things like that. So we already have the evaluation set up. Um, 
it is uh, part of the idea of our game is to do somewhat of a simulation of, you know, sort of a, a fantasy real world setting. Um, so, but it, it's not exactly what I would call a simulation in, in the in terms of like you're having a face to face discussion with somebody, but uh, it's very closely focused on um, particular individual sub skills of argumentation process, and so the evaluation aspect of there of it is already existing before the game is created. So I think we're sort of ahead of the game there. So do you think that's uh, a general methodology for developing serious games? You look at things that can already easily be tested, and then you develop a game out of that to see if you can get learning? Yeah, I'm not saying, I wouldn't say that you have to first develop the entire evaluation scheme, but you should certainly think of that if you're developing an educational game, you've got to think about that all of the all along the way is how can we measure whether or not this is being effective? And the, you know the same is true for the intelligent tutoring systems. Um, and but it's in people who are developing these things, so much of the focus is on developing the new technology or the new ideas that it's easy to lose sight of that. That's a good question. Thank you. Question? Next question from over here. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> so it seems like a really interesting kind of thought experiment is to consider how you would take your original uh, life in AutoTutor and sort of plop it into serious games. Yeah. And it seems like it, it raises so many really interesting problems. So for example, how do you uh, even think about what tutorial strategies are like, and what 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 is a good remediation technique? You know, maybe it works in uh, sort of simulated face to face, but uh, maybe it does or doesn't in uh, serious games. Yeah. And so I, I just wonder what your thoughts are, uh, both about uh, sort of uh, do you think it's a good idea, and if you do think it's a good idea, what kind of timeline do you see for the field taking to tackle that? Yeah, that's a it's a really good uh, important sort of area. I, again, I won't have uh, any hard fast answers, but I have been thinking a little bit about this because I was uh, I myself started um, looking at Second Life uh, recently, and one of my colleagues is really into Second Life and uh, was encouraging. He said, you know, you should look at this because uh, he knew that, that I was into educational technology kinds of things. He he thought that there would be some uh, connection there. And you know, DePaul University has an island in Second Life, and he's developed lots of fancy stuff there. And um, when I was at Carnegie Mellon a few weeks ago, I was talking to some some folks there who have uh, working with somebody from University of Washington, figured out how to create an interface from an object in Second Life to a web server, where you could basically send requests to the web server and have it come out of the object as text, and then. They were telling me about this, and it occurred to me that I could actually hook up my research methods tutor using this uh, script and have some object. It has to be a, essentially what would be an inanimate object, because they don't do robots in Second Life. But you could have this object talk to a student as if it were uh, uh, my research methods tutor. And so I've been starting to think about the possibilities of that, and, and I had started to kind of develop something along these lines and and my colleague who's into Second Life sort of reacted against it because he found it as being really against the basic philosophy of Second Life which is Second Life is a place for social uh, interaction between well sort of between people via their avatars as proxies and why would somebody want to go and have a conversation with an inanimate object that's acting as uh, you know, a sort of a, a face, <laughs> it's not face to face, it's face to object <laughs> uh, sort of conversation with this thing. So there's a lot of, uh, of issues there. And well, also for the, this argumentation game, we've been thinking about, well, what, can we put that into Second Life? And why would people even want to interact with this sort of uh, tutorial type application? And uh, Rob Goldstone from Indiana said he does something similar, and basically, if you pay them in Linden dollars, he said they'll do anything. 
<laughs> That's his answer. Yeah. Um, so uh, one, one of the things I think G tries to do in his book is show how well-designed entertainment-focused games implicitly use all these techniques that have already been thought about by people who think about learning a lot, and that makes them effective for, for uh, to, to enhance the learning of how to play them. Yeah. But in a way, that's almost saying uh, there's nothing really special about games, about games themselves that, that foster this type of learning. It, it, because games have been built to take advantage of these principles that, are, that other people have kind of already thought about and identified. And I'm wondering what you think that there is about the game and the player who's right. playing a game that differentiates it from a well-designed website or conventional educational technology or some or a film, an educational film. Well, uh, yeah, that's a, a good question. A couple of the key things that seem to be, you know, again coming out of the the G's principles, some of them really are focused on games, uh, sort of unique to games, perhaps. Um, the idea of uh, creating a subset of, of what the world is sort of f allowing the student to focus on, the student or the game player, to focus on just the aspects that he or she needs to develop uh, competence at the right level. Um, so the ability of a, a game to kind of uh, clear out, <laughs> clear away the clutter from the real world and to just have important artifacts that the uh, player has to interact with. Uh, another, another would be the, the level of interactivity and of uh, making, making choices. Uh, but before that, before that I, w I would say that the, the um, kind of ability to build up from bottom up kind of construction from things that they perceive to, okay, uh, understanding I can use this kind of object in a certain way and then to do the metacognitive step to sort of think about, well, maybe there's a set of objects that I can do this kind of set of operations on. So the sort of building block constructing approach. And then also that, uh, whatever it was that I said before, the, uh, oh, the interactivity of, and it's not just the fact that there's, uh, the student is always having to do something, but that they're always having to make a choice, which is essentially practicing applying information that they've gotten from the game and to and evaluating that information and coming up with a new way of uh, dealing with that information. Those are the three that jump out to me. But if, if some other people, I would be happy to, if anybody else has a, an answer to that question too. Do you have an answer to that question? <laughs> well, so I, I, I um... I kind of think that there's something fundamentally different in the relationship between a player and a game than between a user and uh, some other software artifact. And uh, you know, I can't point to what that is exactly, but I think it's cognitive and, and affective and has to do with interactivity, but also with uh, what the game developers and game designers call the magic circle, which is this idea that when you step in to play a game, you, it's almost like the idea of willing suspension of disbelief for film. You enter into this contract with the game and the game makers implicitly that it's going to do something differently, and your your rules, new new rules apply to that to that environment or world. Um, and it would be interesting to see what, like, for to think about what, how that uh, fosters uh, the type of. Cognitive responses that 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 create learning. Yeah, I, I agree, it, but it, it just also got me thinking about. Well, I wonder if there's a magic circle in uh, your my tutoring system or your tutoring system or James. What do you think about it? if when when uh, students are using one of your intelligent tutoring systems? Do they have a, is there a magic circle that they know that there's a set of rules that is different? in the interaction that they're having? Absolutely, yeah. And I, I don't think there's anything original about it. I think it just so happens because it's sort of a fantasy kind of setting. Uh, it happens to have education underneath it, but they don't really care about that. And it's an interactive, fun setting that calls upon them to be imaginative and 
they have these expectations about enjoying themselves, I think. Mm -hmm. So, Michael, do you think that there's a, is, is more magic in the game or not? Well, I, I think it's not a binary thing. Right. right? It's and, a, and it's a continuum of magic. A scale. Magicity. So, a lot of ITSs have interfaces on them that you could describe as a game, or, you know, the whole design of the interaction is designed that someone could say it's a game, another person could say it's a educational software. So it's it's not, there's, there's it's hard to say, you know, right. where that line is. Oh, time for one more question. Um, too late. Uh, in my experience with uh, games, the flow, control flow through the game is rather static. You're solving a problem, but the game designer has done a predetermined uh, solution path. Uh, specifically, I remember doing a research study, or being one of the participants in a research study of Dr. Lester's, where there's this crystal island, you're trying to diagnose a disease. And the solution path is static, and it doesn't really address the dynamic nature of tutoring, which uh, intelligent tutoring systems have, and it seems like you're lear limiting the ability to teach or tailor the teaching to the student, which is what the large benefit of using tutoring is. How are you addressing that, and why are games better than tutoring systems which dynamically tailor themselves to the student? Uh, that's a good question, and, and this may actually be a way that um, intelligent tutoring games can, sorry, intelligent tutoring systems can learn from educational games uh, concept and you know this this showed up in one of G's um, one of these many principles about multiple yeah this multiple routes thing so you know the idea here is that for a, a player to progress there should be um, multiple ways of doing it some better than others and so that they can practice making choices and they can learn about the outcomes uh, of the choices that they make and uh, I agree that I've certainly seen lots of uh, intelligent tutoring systems where there has been just a sort of one path to, to a solution. Uh, and that, that might be something that we want to consider as a way of um, expanding the, improving the uh, effectiveness of tutoring systems. Before we thank uh, Peter for, for his presentation, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is Peter's presentation today is one in a series of uh, the Future of Games talks. The next series, uh, the next speaker is this time Wednesday, a week from now, at 1.30, and it's David Smith, who is one of the creators of the system called Croquet, which is an open source, uh, something that's comparable to Second Life. So it's an open source version of a 3D interactive environment, and it's used a lot for uh, distance ed type applications, but um, David will talk about the technical and kind of um, uh, other business oriented applications for it. Um, Peter is here, uh, Peter's on sabbatical from DePaul this semester and is here for a two week visit. So um, if you don't get a chance to talk to him in depth after the talk, please see him or email him or email me and I'll email him for you uh, to set up some time if you're interested in talking while he's here. Um, so thank you very much, Peter, for a great talk. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Talks. The next series. Uh, the next.